<clears throat> okay, everyone, I think we got it figured out. Is it live? Is there audio on? Are you zoomed in, in focus, and framed where you want it? Last chance. Okay, we're good to go. So we already prayed, so we're not going to do that again just for theater. So we're going to go through, let's see, let's start. I'll give everyone a chance to take your last phone call or. <laughs> yes. College. Okay. Sure will. All right, everyone. Acts chapter 27. Let's start with reading uh, verses 14 through 19, and then we'll jump in. All right. 14 through 19. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Uruk Leden. Mm -hmm. We need to use that word more often, I think. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running her under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. All right, so we're going to talk about a lot of sailing and nautical terms, and anyone that was in the Navy, I'm going to direct all the questions to you. So starting in verses 14 and 15, this unique storm system that drove Paul's ship was called a... <laughs> okay, so it's a it's a word that is a hybrid of Greek and Latin, and it means a northeasterly wind. I know, and I don't know why they don't, but that's that's what it is. So it's nothing all that significant, but that's the what the word means. So the storm was so violent that cables had to be lashed underneath the ship to keep the planking from pulling apart. That's what it's talking about here in uh, verse 15. Um, sorry, or in uh, verse, no, actually, yeah, I'm getting down to that. I'm getting a little bit uh, ahead of myself. So in verses 16 and 17, uh their ship, the ship that Paul was on, is blown past the small island of Clauda in the direction of uh, Syrtis, the northern coast of Africa. So remember, the trip started in Jerusalem. It went north to present-day Lebanon, which was Sidon. Uh, they went uh, and sailed north of Cyprus, uh, the under the southern part of Turkey, they landed in two spots, and then they um, uh, sailed over to the eastern coast of the island of Crete. And then they made one more stop and had to make a decision while they were at this one little town. What was the decision they had to make? Yes, to stop or keep going. What was that? Okay, they do end up getting in a different boat. But uh, they actually, I think they did that prior to getting to Crete. They went in, they got into a bigger boat. But more specifically, when you say to keep going or stop, what are we talking about? It was. It was a stormy season. So if they had to stop, what are we talking about? What? For what? How long? Um, yeah, they're going to be there through the winter. So we're talking several months that they're just going to have. So remember, at this time, most armies would take the winter off because they 
depending on the part of the world that you were fighting in, you didn't have the means to survive in the wilderness with that many people. Okay, there was no electricity or gas or diesel powered anything. It was so lots of armies would oftentimes winter. We, we did that all the way back uh, not too long ago in the Revolutionary War. You remember the uh, uh, Valley Forge? The, the soldiers were taking the winter off because it was just too much snow and too cold. So the idea of, you know, battle just didn't make sense. Well, in the same way, there are seasons for sailing where it, it wasn't going to make any sense. There's too many storms. So we just have to hunker down for the winter. So what was the problem with doing that on this southern coast of Crete? There wasn't. It was a very small town. There wasn't anything there. And... And we're talking about a boat, and we're going to see how many people were in the boat. And the idea was, this little town is going to be really hard to winter in for this large of a group of guys. It wasn't practical, so they had two bad options, and they decided to go and push on to be able to sail to a bigger, better town to winter in. But on their way, they got caught in the storm, and the storm was blowing them in the direction of the coast of Africa. So they were being blown on their way to the, uh, the northern portion of Africa here in Libya. And then they were able to uh, miss the continent of Africa and start heading up toward and where they finally land. Or I don't, wanna, I don't know if land is the right word. What do you call it? Well, how about this? Run aground in uh, the tiny island of Malta. So Malta, if you're familiar, hey, Matt, come here. Uh, if you're familiar with Italy, you have the boot and you have the, you know, the little island that it's kicking. Well, below that is a much, much, much tinier island called Malta. So you can't even, you know, see it on the map because the the marker is fatter than the, than the island. Anyway, that is where Paul and his ship run aground. So that's what we're leading up to. All right, so let's see. So the, sh the ship was able to uh, turn and go more west and then northwest in the direction of Malta. Now, in verses 16 and 17, they mention uh, quicksands in verse 17. That's referring to a type of sandbar. It wasn't quicksand in the way that you and I might think of it, like in a Bugs Bunny cartoon or in an old Western. Um, but that was a type of sandbar that they were trying to avoid. They didn't want to run the ship aground. Now, in verse 18, it says that they lighted the ship. What does that mean? That's right. You start throwing stuff over. You took whatever was necessary and threw it overboard. Now, is that step taken lightly? No. At what point, if you're sailing, would you start throwing things overboard? In a dire situation. That's what it comes down to. You are convinced that you are going to die. Now, I, I'm not a sailor by any means. I've been on lots of boats. I've been on sailboats. I've been on boats that have been out in the ocean for several days. But bigger ones, none where I was concerned that there was going to be a situation like this. One pastor that I really like was telling uh, me a story. Well, he wasn't telling me. I was at a Bible conference with 2,000 other guys. But he was telling the story about after, so he graduated from college, he joined the Marines. After he was done with the Marines, he really didn't know what to do. And he was, um, uh, his pastor approached him and said, hey, I have a guy that needs one more person to uh, be on the crew of a boat that's going to go, I don't know, from here to there. They were either crossing the Atlantic or the Pacific, but they were going to be on a boat that I think could, two or three guys could, you know, stay in and sail. So it was, it was a smaller ship. And uh, he was a young guy with nothing to do and it was going to pay and it sounded exciting. So he said, you know, let's do it. I don't have a lot of experience. And the guy said, that's fine. I've been sailing my entire life. 
He's like, I'm going to teach you in the first couple days. It's not a hardship to um, be able to man, but you know, I want a second guy. So they got caught in a ferocious storm. And he said they started throwing things overboard because they were both convinced they were going to die. It was bad. So you have to get all the weight off of the ship. He said, when you are doing that, you have no valuables at all. Just everything overboard. Bible overboard. You know, wallet and money overboard. Mother-in-law <laughs> overboard. Okay. Literally anything in your life, you just grab it. And you don't care. There is nothing in your life that you value anymore because if you don't do this, you're going to die. This is critical. So when they were doing this, and you got to remember the people that were doing this were professional seamen, the captain and the sailors on board of the ship. They, you know, these are guys that know what they're doing and they are throwing everything overboard. So you have to understand the seriousness of this storm. I, it is hard for me to understand that because I've never been in it. But from anyone that's ever told me the situation, you are so scared to death, you are just grabbing everything that's not nailed down and just throwing it overboard. So it gets worse. In verse 19, so this is the third day, what were they getting rid of? Yeah. Yes, it is. This is now essential gear. This is no longer get rid of the unessential stuff in hopes that we live. Now it's down to the things that we need to be able to sail the ship. We're getting rid of those too. So this is bad. Rigging and cargo. All right, let's read verses 20 to 25. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. All right, what did maritime navigation require? <laughs> it required the stars. And to a lesser degree in the daytime, the sun, right? Uh, so there was no GPS. And after being driven by the storm for many days, they were lost. Moreover, all hope of being saved was taken away. That's what the Bible says. All hope of being saved was taken away. So no one on board believed they were going to live. That was a bad, dire, scary situation. Now, in verse 21, Paul makes a statement. What's another way of saying what Paul said in verse 21? I told you so. I don't know why he started with that, but that's what he started with. You should have you should have hearkened unto me and not done this, but done what I told you to do. <clears throat> so that's not exactly a page out of Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, but either way, he was uh he was public speaking. He didn't start out didn't start out well. In verses 22 and 23, Paul was told by an angel of God that no life would be lost only the ship would be destroyed. 
Now, I don't know if that encouraged anyone on board, um, but this is what Paul told everyone. Yeah, boat's gone, but don't worry. We're all going to live. Oh, and I should say, the ship will be destroyed. You know the difference between a boat and a ship? I've gotten in trouble before. So you put boats on ships. So when the ship is going down, y'all get in boats, and that's what you're saved at. You're rescued out of a lifeboat. Okay, you don't, the Navy isn't a fleet of boats. It's a fleet of ships. On those ships, they have little boats. Okay, so that's, like I said, I've gotten in trouble before because I don't know the lingo. So <clears throat> let's see, where were we? Okay, so the ship is going down, but don't worry, everybody is going to live. Yeah, take comfort in this. And keep in mind, they, they can't see the sun. They can't, okay, understand. Now, these are, these, it's easy to read past this quickly. We've all had days where you can't see, you know, or we've all had nights where you can't see the stars, but it's got to be reasonably overcast to not see the sun when it's over, when there's lots of clouds, you can still like, oh, the sun's behind that one because it's a bright spot. It's got to be pretty, you know, cloudy with dark, rainy kind of clouds to not be able to see the sun. And they've been going through that for days. So they don't know what direction they're going in. And the storm is so bad that they lash everything together and they're just heading, they're going with the wind and the waves. They said they had to wrap bands around the bottom of the boat to keep the planks from breaking out. Later on, we're going to find out that they had to lash the rudders down. They took the sail and the mast down. I mean, this was a bad, bad storm. And we're going to find out in a minute that it goes on for two straight weeks. And it, it said by day three that the captain thought he was going to die. The captain is writing a letter and rolling it up and putting it in a bottle and throwing it out in the ocean, hoping his wife will get it one day because he is convinced he's going to die. That was day three. Yep. And Paul comes out and says, don't worry. No, no, no. I mean, the ship is gone. Yeah. Obviously, the ship is gone. But we're all going to live. So in verses 24 and 25, understand that maybe two or three folks on board the ship believed in Jesus and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The rest of them probably looked at Paul like he had two heads when he came out and said this. Now, there's a chance that a good portion of the folks on the boat were saved because Paul was an evangelist. Paul was a preacher. Wherever Paul went, he gave people the gospel and people got saved. But understand that, and we're getting there, that we're talking about hundreds of people, most of them um, criminals, Roman soldiers. Not a lot of them were Jewish. You know, not a lot of them were raised believing in anything of the, of the law of Moses and the prophets. So other than uh, Paul and his company, which included Luke and one other person that we know of, you know, there might not have been anyone else that what I'm saying is the reaction might have been from all the sailors looking at each other like, who is this guy? What, who let him up on the deck? Go away. Like, what are you? Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Oh, we're all going to be okay. Great. You know, it, trying to just paint the scene here. All right. So now let's talk about Paul's visions. And we're going to get into this, and we're just going to see if we can uh, get some class participation. Paul has several visions. Who can name me one? Very good. Road to Damascus. Let's see. We're going to call that number one. And what happened on that road, David? David? Paul got saved. Good. Okay. There's an easy one that someone can jump on real quick. Very good. Number seven. Okay. 
not going to die on the ship. We just said that he had a vision. So that's number seven. We got five more to go. Very good. When he got caught up to the third heaven, let me see which order that is. Okay, so that one is actually going to be outside of this list. We're going to get to that one. Let me see and make sure. Um, no, no. We, we don't get any details about the one David mentioned. So the one David mentioned, which we're going to get into, is when Paul gets caught up to heaven. So Paul gets raptured. And he goes to heaven, and he meets with Jesus, and he gets taught something, and then he comes back. But, but that one, it doesn't say specifically. What were you thinking? So uh, you have the two-year period, which, and that wasn't, again, that wasn't a vision. Right after Paul gets saved and gets a sight back, he goes down to Saudi Arabia and has a two-year time down there. So he has a vision of Ananias coming to uh, minister to him and give him back his sight, which was right after that one. Um, he is, he has a vision when God calls him to minister onto the Gentiles. That one is Acts, uh, 22. Yep. Okay. So that was, uh, when he had difficulty in Corinth. So Paul was going through a real difficult time in Corinth, and the Lord came and encouraged him. So that's Acts chapter 18. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, he had one uh, in Macedonia. Okay, so that was when Paul said, when Paul, I, and, and keep in mind that, that we're going off of my memory, which is bad. So when Paul was in Macedonia, which was Acts 16, I believe that's when Paul and Barnabas split. Barnabas and Silas went this way, and Paul, no, Barnabas and Mark went that way, and Paul and Silas went north. And Paul said, well, we're just going to go and minister to these guys. And they were stopped. And he's like, well, then we're just going to go here. And they were stopped. And he's like, we're going to go up north. And they were stopped. And then Paul got a vision and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go here. And that brought him on his first trip up and over into Europe and down through Greece, where they did Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. So that was the vision in Macedonia in Acts chapter 16. And then the last one uh, was in Acts 23, uh, after he was arrested in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So those were several visions that Paul had. You can look them up. They're all in the book of Acts, obviously. So along with these uh, special visions, got them. Along with these special visions that Paul had, uh, he was also, um, it was also told to Paul uh, the idea of the church, the New Testament church, and how it works in Ephesians verses one through in Ephesians chapter three verses one through six, that was revealed to Paul. We also have Paul when he was taken to heaven, uh, which was earlier on in his ministry, and we read about that in David. Did you say Second Corinthians or was, I don't remember? Yeah, where I was caught up into the third heaven. Yeah, I don't rem I don't remember which one it is either. I always have to look it up. But anyway, and and we're not going to we're not going to turn to all these. Uh and then let's see. So Paul gets 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul is caught up to the uh third heaven. Real quick, do you guys know what I mean when I say third heaven? 
Heaven one, heaven two, heaven three. Heaven one is our atmosphere. Uh, that's where the birds fly. That's what the book, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, the book of Genesis talks about, that the birds fly in the open firmament of heaven. That's our atmosphere. Number two is outer space. Uh, that's uh, God talks about that also in the book of Genesis. That's where the sun, moon, and stars are. Uh, and then you have heaven number three. Heaven number three is outside of our universe. Uh, this is one that you cannot get to uh, with, you know, a spaceship or, you know, Star Trek or whatever. You can get on board the Enterprise and go as far as you want. You're never going to get to this one. And this is where God lives. That is in eternity. Okay, so when we, the Bible does talk about three heavens, but it's misleading because when we hear the term heaven, we think like heaven where God is. And unfortunately, there are some, you know, knockoff Christian cults that talk about multiple types of heaven that you can go to depending on how good you are and if you are part of their church. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible defines them as where the birds fly, where God put the sun, moon, and stars outside of our universe where God lives. So when Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven, he was caught up to uh, where God lives. Carlos, what you got, bud? That is exactly how Mormons got their one, two, and three heaven. So, so for all of you, just so you know, the way the Mormons teach it is, guess who gets into the third heaven? Everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even kidding you. Uh, then you have uh, lousy, uh, the second heaven is lousy members of the Mormon church. Then number heaven number one is good, obedient members of the Mormon church. And I'm not even kidding you. That's how they teach it. And it's nonsense and it's nowhere found in the Bible. But who needs the Bible? If you're going to make up a religion, I wouldn't suggest using the Bible. You're going to run into all types of problems. So if you're going to make something up, just make it up. Do it like old, uh, what's his name did? Uh, no, uh, no, he didn't make it up. But the guy that did was, uh, yeah, uh, L. Ron Hubbard. If you're going to make up a religion, just go ahead and be a successful science fiction author and decide one day that you're going to be God. That's the way to, that's the way to do it. At least that guy had flair. Okay. So, uh, so Paul was caught up to the third heaven. We're getting, we're getting off. <laughs> um, I don't want to get into, uh, who he was and, and his many problems and, uh, the Masonic Lodge. So we're just gonna kick that one and keep going. All right. Um, <clears throat> Let's read Acts chapter 27, verses 26 to 37. 26 to 37. How be it? We must cast upon a certain island. But when the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, this day is the 14th day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And let's see. Am I got, yeah, I'm going to read one more verse. And we were all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. All right, so let's keep moving so we can finish up this chapter. So finally, after 14 nights of hopeless, uh, intermittent drifting and driving wind and rain, the men 
aboard the ship heard something. So over the howling wind, the sailors made out the faint rumblings of waves crashing. Now, on a ship, and and do your own homework because I'm, I'm, there's a good chance this is not going to be, you know, terribly accurate. On a ship of this size, you are going to have several people on deck 24 hours a day. And they're going to have three shifts per day. And some of their duties are to be a lookout because you need to see if there is a problem because the ocean changes. You'll have sandbars where all of a sudden you can run aground where the last time you were there, you know, you didn't. You might have a wreck of some kind, you know, from another ship that you could hit. They also had people that when they were on lookout, they were not just looking, but they were also listening because ships that are going through fog, which I know was not the case, they would light lanterns, they would ring bells if they were not ships of war and under, you know, um, uh, noise discipline. Uh, you, you wanted to be on the lookout, you wanted to be listening And what these guys were able to hear were the waves crashing. What does that mean? You got it. They're crashing against something. All right. They're not, we're not just talking about water hitting water. The water is hitting rocks. We're near land. So then when they heard the waves crashing on the rocks, they knew that they were going into shallower water and the helmsman commanded that they find out the depth. Now in verse 28, it says, that they, so just to read it, uh, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded in verse 28. What does that mean that they sounded? Yes. So sounding is a mechanism for measuring the depth of the water in the first century Roman time they had a lead sounding device that was like a bell-shaped object they would affix to a rope, and the sounding device would be dropped overboard, and it would sink down, and they would have markings on the rope or tie-off knots and know how deep it was, and the sailors would be able to determine the depth of the water from when this thing would strike, reverberate the rope, and they would know that they had hit something. So they were trying to guess how deep the water was, which means obviously the more shallow the water is, the closer we're getting to land because that's what land is, the high spot that the water doesn't get up and over. So as they're doing this, um, it talks about them measuring the depth of the water. Now, we can go back and kind of look at a few of these things, but this is one of the clues, because understand, I did everyone get the email that I sent out with the pictures of the anchors? Yes. Okay, that I sent it out last week, but it was really for tonight's lesson. Well, I don't have your email. I got to get you on the email list. Yeah. So if anyone wants to pull up that email, we're going to be talking about those pictures that I sent you guys. If you want to, you know, get on a phone and, and take a look at that. I figured if I just emailed everyone one or two pictures, it'd be easier than me getting the projector out or, you know, doing something like that. So they're measuring the depth. Okay. Sorry. Let me, I kind of jumped ahead. The anchors of this boat were recovered. That's what happened. Now you say, well, how are they recovered? Well, they were recovered because of the incredible amount of details written down by Luke so that they were able to know it's in this general area we need to search. And they went there and they found the anchors. So one of the things that Luke is telling them or telling us is the depth of the water. Well, guess what? I hate to be the one to break it to everyone, but the depth of the water doesn't really change. Okay, yes, we have high tide and low tide, but the fact is, you know, despite what every, you know, tree-hugging, liberal, pinko, commie nut job is telling you about how the water in the oceans is rising, it's not. <laughs> it's just not. So when you know the depth of the water, that helps when you're determining where something is. Okay, so what is 
a fathom. It is a measurement. It's a measurement of a depth. Close. It is six feet. Good. Oh, okay. You just, you just got on Google now. Okay, good. Wonderful. Like right when we were reading. Okay. So yes. So a fathom is six feet. So how deep was the first measurement? 120 feet. Okay, good. Yeah. But then they measure it again. And what do they find? You got it. 15 fathoms, which is okay, good. So we're, we're getting close to land and we're getting there quickly. All right. Anyone know what a league is? <laughs> a league is another measurement. It is three miles. Okay. Does any, anyone ever hear of the, you know, the movie 20,000 leagues under the sea? It was a book. Okay. Understand that was not talking about the depth. The submarine was under the water. It, it traveled 20,000 leagues. It was a distance. A league is three miles. It was under the sea. Okay, the, the ship was not 60,000 miles under the ocean. That's not, yeah, yeah, sorry. I just ruined the movie for you. Okay, so um, let's see, where were we? All right, so the first recorded depth was 120 feet or, or uh, 20 fathoms. Second one, second sounding was 90 feet or 15 fathoms. So the captain of the ship knew that they were approaching land, gave the order to drop four anchors from the stern. Now, in verse 29, uh, we read about these anchors. Now, this is where I sent you the picture. I sent you two pictures. Number one, the actual anchors that are found in the Maritime Museum of Malta and number two is an example of an anchor and the size of it with a woman standing next to it to give some perspective. So the first century anchors on the Alexandrian grain freighter would have been approximately 12 feet tall, and they would have been made entirely of wood except for the piece that ran across the bottom, uh, which was lead. And I emailed you all a picture last week showing you one of these anchors. Did anyone get out the picture and pass it around? Okay, so sorry. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Um, there you go. <clears throat> All right, so the anchor stock or the crossbar of the anchor would have been made of solid lead. The wood over the years would have been, you know, rotted away. Uh, and decayed, uh, but the lead crossbar would last indefinitely. And the picture that I sent is the lead crossbar that sits today in the Maritime Museum at Malta. So what's going on here in verse 30? Yeah, they were about to abandon ship. So they were lowering down a lifeboat and they were getting ready to uh, uh, abandon ship because they thought the ship was lost. They thought they were all going to die. Now, what does Paul tell them? Yep. He says, if you're going to do that, you're going to die out there. So for whatever reason, uh, they listened to Paul. Now, remember, out of everyone on the ship, Paul has... Zero authority, zero credibility with any of these people. As far as he is not in charge of the ship, he was not a sailor as part of his life. He is not familiar with any of this. Um, the only reason that they would listen to him is if they believed that Paul was a prophet. If they believed that when he came and said, God said this, they believed him. And they said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to trust this guy because we believe what he is saying is true and that he has a direct line to God and God is speaking to him. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Out there is death. They're like, well, if we have to make a decision, let's go. Maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. Uh, the one that was on this boat, the centurion that was leading this party, I don't know. I thought that yeah i i don't know nick and to be honest with you i didn't even read ahead to the end of 
the book, so I can't even tell you what happens in 28 because it's been so long since I read it. Previously, I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to look it up. Okay, so these guys believe Paul, um, and the soldiers cut loose the lifeboat. We read that in verse 32. In verse 33, why did why didn't anyone eat for two weeks? That's what I'm assuming. If you're going to be in a storm, a bad storm, for two straight weeks, I can't imagine it would be easy to eat anything. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to keep anything down. So, Oh, yeah. No one's saying they didn't have food. We're saying, yeah, they didn't eat it because, yeah, it had to be, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, Paul asks them to eat in verse 34 and reminds the men that nobody will die. And furthermore, nobody will be injured. Then in verses 35 and 36, Paul prayed and thanked God and everyone ate and their mood improved. And the Bible says they were all of good cheer. So again, Going from by day three, the captain along. Have you guys ever seen it, it's a it's a famous uh you know shtick in comedy where um you'll take the guy that's in charge of the spaceship or the boat or whatever, and uh you know they're all looking to that captain for encouragement, and you know, then all of a sudden something happens and he snaps and he's like we're all going to die, we're, you know, and everyone, obviously everyone's, you know, mood just plummets because the person that, so anyway, that happened on day number three, on day number three, the captain's like, yep, we're all going to die, you know, every man for himself, good luck, and now the storm goes on for 11 more days, and Luke writes that they were all of good cheer, so they all, they listen to Paul, they eat bread, they watch him pray for it and thank God and their mood improves and they were all of good cheer. Again, I have to believe that these people were putting their trust in the Lord. These people were turning to the man of God and saying, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about. And, and let's not forget how long were they all on a boat together before the shipwreck? A long time, a long time. So um, I believe that Paul was a natural leader, and I believe he loved these people, and they knew it, and that's why they were willing to follow him. Okay, in verse 37, how many people were aboard the boat? 276. How many is a score? 20. Very good. Okay, verse 38, and we're going to read verse 38 to the end. And we're going to push on through and get done with this chapter. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat for this. It wait. No, that can't be right. Sorry. Verse 38 to the end. We already read that. Okay. Verse 38. And when they had eaten enough, they lighted the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. Now let's notice the details talking about where they're going to run aground. Because remember, we have to search that area of Malta to find the anchors. So we find how deep the water was, right? Right offshore. We find out that there was a creek with a shore into which they were thinking, you know, this is where we're going to where we're going to go. Verse 40, and when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail uh, to the wind and made toward shore and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the four part uh, stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves, and the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest 
some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. So, so let's see. So number one in verse 38, they threw overboard what they did not eat. They got rid of the rest of their food. And then in verse 39, Luke describes the location of Paul's shipwreck as being in front of a bay that has a beach. Now, I'm not going to try to draw a really good picture of Malta, but let's just call this Malta. There's, you know, it's a lot more detailed than that. It doesn't just look like a raindrop on its side or whatever you want to say. But yeah, this this island, one thing it, it now I've never been to Malta, okay, but I've looked I've looked it up topographically on a map. One thing you find out about Malta is that the majority of it is cliffs. There are very few shores that fit this description. There's only a couple. So it wasn't hard to narrow down the places that Paul could have been. Now, if you go on a map, you see one bay that's up in the north, you know, northwest. Well, it, it's the north portion of Malta. What's it called? St. Paul's Bay. This is not where Paul crash landed. It's not. Okay, the anchors were found down here. Okay, I think it's Thomas. I think if I think if you find one, it's St. Thomas's Bay. No, there's another one. I might be wrong, but I'll, I'm getting to it in a minute. Is there a? There is. Okay. So in St. Thomas's Bay is where they found uh, the remnants of the, the anchors and uh, where the story works out. In St. Paul's Bay, it does not fit the description of the Bible. Now, if you go to Malta, all of the touristy stuff having to do with the Bible and the book of Acts, and Paul, it's in St. Paul's Bay. Since they... Now, then after Malta was built up, and I've never been to Malta, it looks beautiful. I mean, if I'm going to go on vacation to Europe, that's the island I'm going to. It looks beautiful. <clears throat> so much of the tourism was built up here around some of this idea. And then after that, they start, someone had the idea of searching for the anchors and they take the Bible and they go out and start searching for it based on the description and they find it. And where do they find it? On the opposite side of the island. Well, guess what? The people of Malta were not very excited about that discovery because they had already built up this section of the island for tourism with hotels and museums. And, you know, Saint, they named it St. Paul's Bay. But just understand that that's not actually where it was. Do you guys know... Um, who discovered oil in the Middle East? Okay. It was a man from an oil company who was a devout Christian who from the descriptions in the Bible went to his board and said, there is oil in this part of the world and there's a lot of it. We need to drill in the Middle East. But it was a Christian man using the Bible that determined that there was oil in the Middle East. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're getting off track. Okay, so uh, let's see. Since most of Malta's coastline is a cliff area, the vast majority of the search area can quickly be eliminated. Luke describes this bay with a beach as having a reef in front of it where two seas collide. In verse 40, so they loose the rudder bands. Okay, so in a storm, you have to secure the rudder so it doesn't break. Otherwise, when the ship is out of the storm, you're unable to steer it. Now, in the ship that Paul was in, it was different than what we're used to thinking of as a rudder. If you look at the pictures that I sent you, they had these large oars off of the front of the ship, two of them, and that's what they used to steer the ship. So there wasn't like one uh, rudder in the back, you know, like on your typical, you know, rowboat or Viking ship or whatever kind of boat you're imagining. 
So the course of drift was verified using um, a computer system of the operation center of the armed forces of Malta, which served as the search and rescue uh, coordination center for Malta. Uh, their computer program matched the course of drift as Luke described it and revealed that the ship of Paul would have impacted on the southeast coast of Malta. The only bay that matches all the criteria in the scripture was St. Thomas's Bay. Uh, they went there, they looked, they found the anchors. Uh, the surviving anchor stocks currently are on display at the Maritime Museum on Malta. They've been inspected, they've been inspected by Professor Bana um, Banano. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. He is considered to be the foremost expert in Malta on Roman antiquities. Dr. Bonanno earned a PhD from the prestigious University of London Institute of Archaeology and has taught at the University of Malta since 1971. Dr. Bonanno has concluded that these anchor stocks are appropriate to the era of Paul and his shipwreck in Malta. <sighs> um, I'd have to... I'd have to look it up. I had that in front of me at some point in the last two weeks, but I don't remember. So, um, but yes, uh, recent as I, th I thought maybe it was in the last 50, okay. but it wasn't, it, it was, it was recent because computers and sonar uh, was used, you know, in finding it. So I don't know how long ago that technology exists. Anyway, we, I'm sure we could look it up and it wouldn't be that hard, but um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago. All right, let's get through the last couple verses. Verse 42. Why did the soldiers want to kill the prisoners? Uh, okay. Why did the soldiers not want the prisoners escaping? Okay. More than responsible liable is the correct answer. So what do you mean when you say the, they were liable? Okay. So if any of the prisoners were going to serve a capital sentence. That means they were going to be executed. If that prisoner escaped, the guard responsible would have to take the place of the prisoner. If a prisoner had to serve 10 years and he escaped, the jailer responsible would have to serve the 10 years. So you took your job very seriously as a guard. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Now... You wouldn't get in trouble for killing a prisoner, but if a prisoner escaped, the soldier would have to pay the price. So for them in this situation, the answer was simple. Just kill all the prisoners. Then we don't have to worry about them escaping and us being held responsible. Um, so in verse 43... Nineteen seventy one. There you go. 50... Almost, yeah, 50 years on the button. So in, uh, in verse 43, we find out that the centurion that was uh, in charge uh, told everyone, no, we're not going to, um, you know, kill everybody. And he told everyone that could swim, go ahead and jump in and swim to land. Now, as a Roman, understand that Roman soldiers could swim. It was part of your training. You had, you know, you had to be able to know how to swim. As far as the prisoners, it was more of a, well, yeah, good luck, you know. So that's why you see some of them uh, found pieces of wood from the ship. Others, it says, uh, were on surfboards, if I'm reading that right. It says, and the rest, some on boards. We obviously assume those were surfboards. And some on broken pieces of the ship you know, and they got to land. So some of the prisoners could swim, some maybe couldn't. The Roman soldiers were not that concerned. They decided we will not kill them. We will give them a chance to get to land. But if they, well, if they die on the way, like, you know, we're not lifeguards. We're, you know, we're, we, we're there to make sure they don't escape. Yeah. And uh, so everyone uh, escaped and got to land. Okay. So Let's just go over a question or two for discussion that's entertaining. Oh, you know what? We never even, there was something I missed. There was a whole thing I wanted to talk about. And uh, wait, did we? We're, 
I I skipped something. We'll get to it in a minute. That's okay. Um, there was the homework assignment I gave you last week. I didn't even bring it up. All right, so why did the shipwreck occur? Brainstorming phase. Brainstorming session. It's the easy one because God said so. Any, any. It was storm season. I'm going to leave that up for a minute. Okay, so how about this? Was Paul in God's will, or was it a sit, or was it satanic opposition? Because remember, when bad things happen, there are several options, right? There is satanic opposition. Okay, there is the hand of God upon you for His purpose. Okay, and there is the rain and the sunshine argument which is the sun shines on the just and the unjust and the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous, which just means, hey, guess what? Good things and bad things happen to everybody. So maybe it was just, you know. Well, and, and I don't know the answer, okay, but let me ask you this. How many times was Paul shipwrecked? Close. Close. Yes, three times. Including this one? In, well, I mean, I don't know, but Paul said that he was shipwrecked three times. So in 2 Corinthians 11.25, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. So it happened to Paul somewhat regularly. The, the takeaway is that next time you are on vacation, if the guy next to you's name is Paul, just jump out of the plane right then and there, and you probably have a better chance of surviving because everywhere this guy went, every boat this guy got on seemed to go down. No one died in this one. I don't know about the other two. You know, but... <clears throat> oh, he got hurt. He, yeah, yeah, he died one time. It did. The Lord said, you're going to have to suffer all kinds of things. And, and he did. Yeah. So I don't know what the answer is here. What I do know is that, how about this? <clears throat> God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, I'll tell you what. And, and weakness can be used in a lot of different ways. But what you find is that we are more willing to go to God when we're going through something. When we're having hard times, we'll, we'll go to God. When we're suffering physical ailments, we'll go to God. When we're financially poor, we'll go to God. When we're going through persecution, when we're going through hard times, we will go to God and... God will demonstrate his greatness when we are going through those hard times. When we are on top of the world, it's very easy for us to just take the blessings of God and count them as, well, of course this stuff happens. I'm awesome. <laughs> Why wouldn't good things be happening to me now? And it's easy to write, well, I, you know, I, got a great job and I got a great wife and, you know, just oh, everything's just going great for me. And it's like, no, dummy, it's going great for you because God's blessing you. But it's easy to forget that. Now, I don't know about women, okay? But as far as men go, an easy way for God to get a hold of your attention is to do what? If God wants you praying more, how, how does he put pressure on you? What does he do? What's that? Nick's saying financially. Anyone else want to agree with that? Okay. God takes away your job. God takes away your money. God all of a start starts putting pressure on you financially because a lot of guys are the sole breadwinner in the family, right? So all of a sudden, we're not making money. We feel the pressure, not just for us, but we have a family. And those kids got to eat. They just don't, they want to do it every day. 
So if God wants to drive a man to his knees, what I've seen from talking to thousands of Christian men over years and years and years is that God will often start to put a financial pressure on that guy to try to get him to his knees to start talking to God again. Now, he might do that with women as well. I'm just saying, you know, what I found is that God will do that with the husband all the time. He And why does God do that? Because it works. God will get us to our knees so that we will go to him. So when we're in this place of weakness, all of a sudden we're all ears. When we're in this place of strength, when we're in this place of weakness, I will beg God, God, please bring me in some good paying jobs. I am broke. I don't know what I'm going to do this month. We really need your help. And then when God gives me a straight month of great paying jobs, okay, all of a sudden I forget to pray to God and thank him for all those great paying jobs. But don't worry. He'll get me back to where I'm praying to him about great paying jobs again when he takes him away. Okay, so God's strength is made perfect in weakness. I know lots of great people that have done great things for God throughout history. The majority of them, they don't have the lifestyle that I want. I want a lifestyle of comfort. I want a lifestyle of excess. I want a lifestyle that is problem free. Now, I made the terribly foolish decision to become a pastor and start a church, so problem-free just doesn't exist anymore, okay? But what you find is people that do great things are usually kept in a place where they are constantly close to God. That's the best, that's the safest place to be where we're constantly in need of going to God for whatever's next. That's what I found. Paul, his whole life was like that. I don't know of many characters in the Bible that I could say were closer to God than Paul. There were some great people in the Bible that were very close to God. There's some great prophets in the Old Testament. There's some lots of people that, you know, we can name, but all of them were going through horrible, horrible stuff through the whole story in the Bible. Okay, the only guy that I, I can really think of that does not fit that uh, scenario is Joseph. Now, Joseph had a period in jail, but once, once God said, okay, it's time to be used, even Daniel, who is second in command of two world empires in his lifetime, still had his life threatened by people constantly. He was constantly going through it. Yep. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. God has a plan and God's plan has timing. And we find out that many times something has to happen because it's not ready yet. Even when the Jews left Egypt, God needed a certain amount of time to get the land ready and its inhabitants before they could go in there and chase them out. We read about the times of the Gentiles not being fulfilled. Even when God told Abraham, hey, by the way, you're going to get this land. He said, but we have to wait for the time of the iniquity of the Ammonites to be filled. Do you know what that means? God was giving the pagan people of this land a certain amount of time to get right with him. And he said, I have to give them this many chances before I can say enough. It's the same thing that happened with Jonah, the Ninevites. You want to read about the most wicked, horrible group of people in the history of the world. Okay, when people found out that the Ninevites had surrounded their town, that they were going to lay siege to the town you lived in, you would just go home and kill your family and kill yourself because you knew how horrific it would be to fall into the hands of the Ninevites. And God sent Jonah, right? And he said, you either get right or God's wrath is coming, fire from heaven, you're gone. And the Ninevites turned. 
and they had more time. Now, they ended up going back, and God ended up destroying them. But God gives grace. God is long-suffering, and he has a timeline. Okay, last thing I want to talk about, and this was from, from last week. We said something. Here we go. Verse verse 9. Let's look at this. This was the homework assignment, and we'll be done. In verse 9 of chapter 27, what does Paul mean when he says the fast? In verse 9, he says, Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past. Uh-huh. So what was it? What was Paul saying? Paul was saying we shouldn't be sailing now because the fast is already passed. What did that mean? What's that? Yes. So we have that's okay. So there's only one feast day where you fast. Does anyone know what it is? Okay, how about this? Okay. <laughs> no, that's no, that's not a feast day. Okay, so first of all, there are seven feast days. What are they? Okay, <clears throat> you have Passover. What's next after Passover? Okay, uh, Easter is not a feast. Uh, it is a pagan holiday. <clears throat> unleavened bread. Okay, you have the feast of unleavened bread. Then, the feast of first fruits. Okay, then 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits is Pentecost. Okay, Yom Kippur. Okay, Rosh Hoshana. And then Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so what time of the year are these? Spring. Okay, these are the spring feasts. Passover, Feast of First Fruits. The, remember it this way, the first fruits, the first fruits of the harvest. Well, when do they come? They don't come in the fall, right? They come in the spring. So that's how you remember. The first three are the spring festivals. Okay, the last three are the, we're going to call them fall. And then you have Pentecost right in the middle. So we know what time of the year was it that they were scared to sail. Okay, you got it. They didn't want to sail during winter. They were thinking of wintering in uh, Crete. So we know it was one of the fall feasts. Okay, so which one of the fall feasts has a fast? It was Rosh Hashanah. Um, Yom Kippur is, um, uh, so Rosh Hashanah is the uh, Day of Atonement. And that is when there is a fast. It's the only uh, holy day where there is a fast. Wait, now all of a sudden I feel like I'm messing that up. Okay, let's go to Le let's go to Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll look this up in one second. It does not. There's only one that has a fast. So Leviticus 23. So, Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur. Okay, so, <clears throat> Day of Atonement. So, Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is the day where there's a fast when the high priest goes into the holiest of holies. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. So, on the Day of Atonement, it's the only one of the seven feast days where there is a fast. So, what Paul is saying is, is that the Day of Atonement has already passed, which in the Jewish calendar is the 10th day of the seventh month. That makes it what in our calendar? Roughly. So it happens between uh, middle of September to the first week of October, depending on the year. So it was once it gets to 
the middle of October, they're like, yeah, you can't sail there anymore. Okay, so that's what Paul was talking about in verse 9 when he said um, the fast. Every sailor knew that sailing was difficult, if not impossible, once you got past a certain day. Now, remember, folks, I've, I've, you know, stood on this soapbox a million times. If you don't understand the Old Testament, you will struggle to understand the New Testament because stuff like this is all over the New Testament. Because remember, when the New Testament was written, they didn't have a New Testament. <laughs> when the New Testament was going on, they didn't have a New Testament. Everything that Paul used to teach people about Christ was Old Testament because that's all they had at the time. So he refers in his teaching to the Old Testament all the time. So under knowing and understanding Judaism makes it easy for a Christian to understand Christianity, okay? Because like it or not, Jesus is Jewish. <laughs> so we have to under every author in the Bible but one is Jewish. Did you know that? There's only one author that is not Jewish. Uh, well, that was my next question I was about to ask. Does anyone know the one Gentile author in the whole Bible? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. He wrote one chapter of the book of Daniel. That was it. Yep. Uh, it was when he got better. So Nebuchadnezzar, because of his pride, God brought him low and made him into the way it seems is that he was like a wild animal living off of the grass of the land. And, oh, it was crazy. So Daniel took care of him. And when, when God had grace and mercy on him, he brought him back into power, and Nebuchadnezzar wrote a chapter of the Bible after he got better. I thought it was chapter eh, three or five. I could tell you in one second. Um, but it is the only chapter of the entire Bible written by a Gentile. It's in the book of Daniel, and it is pretty awesome. Let's see. I'm getting there. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace when yada, yada, yada. So Nebuchadnezzar wrote a chapter of the Bible. All right, you guys have been wonderful. We're done. Homework assignment, read Acts chapter 28, and we will finish the book of Acts, and then we will start another book, and it'll be exciting. No, we're not going to get right into a book. I'm going to take a couple of weeks, and I'm going to teach. We're going to take a couple of weeks off of verse by verse, and I'm going to get into some uh, specific subjects that are going to be good and helpful and controversial and upsetting. Because that's the way we do it here. <laughs> All right, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Wayne, would you pray for us, please?